This is Pauline Jennings, and you're listening to Musician Talk. My guest this week is North Fielder, Bo Allen. Bo started playing guitar at 13 and got right down to business by creating several cover bands in his teenage years. After a hiatus during his early adult life, I'm pleased to say he picked that guitar back up and has been going strong ever since. He's played and sang in a handful of groups throughout the years, most recently as a part of local favorite Fred the Bear, who you have likely seen playing in and around Northfield. Well, let's fill in some of the details. Let's talk with Bo Allen. Hey, Bo. Welcome to Musician Talk. Hi, Pauline. Great to be here. Oh, I'm so happy you are. And what a gorgeous day it I'll is say. to yeah to be in Minnesota. Thank God, finally, right? Finally. <laughs> finally. <clears throat> it's a great time to have you on the show because you have a gig coming up at Armory Square with Fred the Bear on the 20th, correct? That is right. Yeah. Awesome. And what time does that start? I believe it's 6, 6 to 9. Okay. And it's Fred the Bear and Friends, so I think we might have some other fun guests come up. Oh, fun. Maybe some family members. And that's outside. I believe it, weather dependent. I got it. <laughs> wow. Of course. Minnesota. Hello. <laughs> so uh, we're going to dig right into your musical journey and just tell me about when you first started playing guitar. Well, um, my parents had divorced. Uh, I was uh, raised in Houston, Texas. I was about nine and already into music. Um, there was an AM station in Houston. Mm-hmm. I would ride my bike there. Back in the day at record stores, they would have a little flyer with a top 40. So I was very much a top 40 kid. But if you wanted to get it before they sent it to the record store, you could go to the station. And uh, I usually would go in the lobby, and they'd have a stack of them there. Um, In fact, one time my favorite DJ, Captain Jack, came out while I was in the lobby. Wow. He gave me, he said, hey, kid, you want this record? It was Doobie Brothers living on the fault line. (laughs) Wow. And they, I, it, it, and they would punch a hole in the cor- upper corner of the when they no longer needed them. Mm-hmm. Um, as a, I think it was a promo. So that, like, I was hooked on music then. Right. And but uh, uh, my mom uh, remarried a guy in the Navy, and he was stationed in Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, and uh, I didn't want to go. Um, they moved out there. She took my brother and sister, and so I had. It was me and my dad, and I had a fair amount of downtime, and my dad had a guitar and piano. And I just finally said, would you teach me a song? Mm -hmm. And I was about 13, and I distinctly remember what it was. It was uh, Honky Tonk Part 2 by Bill Doggett. I think he recorded it in the 1950s, probably 1956. And when you hear the beginning of that song, it's the most simple song you've ever heard. (laughs) Just a basic basic stripped down 12 bar blues on progression and guitar and i there's just something so complete it's this full circle a complete circle and it just it just called and nice and ever since then i was just i was sucked in and and uh, i've been playing ever since that's when you have that fit it feels so natural and yes. like you're home Right. right, you've come yeah. home. Right, yeah, nice. Yeah. So then, what did you do? Did you t- were you self taught? Did you get lessons? Did your dad continue to teach? He you? he didn't really teach me so much. Um, we at that point we probably weren't liking the same types of music. Um, <laughs> although I enjoyed listening to him play. Uh, in Houston, there's a little area called the Village. I grew up right near Rice University, and uh, there was a it was pretty much a preeminent it was kind of like willie's of houston texas it was rock and robin guitars and i i would we would hang out there yeah. you know as kids you know until they kind of closed or scooted us out and um but there i had my eye on this guitar it was presented to me as a gibson sg junior but it didn't have the word gibson on it <laughs> but the the proprietor was Maybe a little bit on the sleazy side, but uh, <laughs> uh, but he said, no, it's a Gibson SG, and I think I got it for 100 bucks, and so uh, with my grandfather's help, and then my grandfather um, said, why don't you take some lessons? And I had this little, all I had was this little pig nose amp. It was an uh, amp about uh, eight inches tall, six inches wide, it had one knob on it, and it, you, could, <laughs> you could work out their battery. So literally, you could see people... A Venice Beach skateboarding with a guitar and a pig nose strapped to their back. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> but my granddad said, you got to take some lessons. And I said, okay. So he lived in an area, there's a lot of something village. It was Highland Village uh, near where he lived in Houston. And this, uh, the guitar sh- uh, this music store had been there forever. 
And uh, so I started taking lessons, and it was this, uh, this just old jazz guy. Oh, nice. And he, he it was greatly revered in the shop. I mean, when he walked in, everybody was like, kind of gave him a nod. And, uh, and, and he was so gentle. You know, mm. He was probably a little too accommodating. Because... <laughs> He I didn't liked, push you. He did not. He did not push me. I liked to play, but I didn't really practice like learning scales and Got it. notes. Um, but he, he he really did actually want to get me based on those fundamentals and blues. So uh, I remember doing the E blues scale, and he would uh, he wanted me to jam, you know, <laughs> and he would do the rhythm part. And he had this cool like Gibson, probably like an ES three thirty five, but flat wound strings and he would say now you play and 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 i would just go up and down the scale <laughs> you know? i just right. didn't have the courage to to leap out and, right. and try and uh, you know i was too worried about hitting wrong notes um but his claim to fame was um he taught billy gibbons of zz top how to play guitar oh wow so so really it's cool. pretty cool lineage but so i did that for about six months um again not a very disciplined practicing young musician but uh but but that was great. I mean, it gave me some fun fundamentals. And I remember I finally got him to write out uh, the notes to Dream On by Aerosmith. And, <laughs> and I, once I figured out that intro, I said, okay, I'm on my way. <laughs> right. You're, you're, you're there. I can, I can you're play Dream On by Aerosmith. Right. Well, I find that interesting because, you know, I mean, there is the difference, different styles to teaching music. And I think that some teachers... Uh, more focus on the classical training, which all the scales, doing your scales, doing right. your scales, doing your scales. And that's great because then you can learn how to improv when you're right. soloing. Um, and then there's more of the uh, uh, teaching for more of learning songs and jamming and, mm -hmm. and, you know, so that you feel that comfortable and you're having fun. Right. Right. So you yeah. get the kid, stay, the kid stays more engaged, I think. I mean, it depends on the child, yeah. of course. But um, <clears throat> that is, I love that story. That is wonderful he's, <laughs> that he's there jamming. And, you know, you're supposed to solo and you're just yeah. doing your scales. I just got up and down. <laughs> I didn't even go up the neck. I just like stayed up there. <laughs> it's, it takes courage, doesn't it? To, yeah, to it improv. does. Yeah. It really does. You, yeah. you, you're making yourself very vulnerable. Right. Yeah, I yeah. still don't vocally scat or anything like that because I don't have enough confidence in my voice that I'm going to hit the right notes. Yeah. And if I probably did some uh, practicing of scales and stuff, maybe I would feel more comfor com and it's comfortable. And it's funny. I, I, I never could learn that way. You know, I, I, I've just always been play by ear. I've read theory. and, and But for me, it was really learning chord structures and then playing by ear that yeah. helped me kind of get. So even when I do solo now i'm thinking in terms of chord structures up the neck and not scales right and, and right right so everybody's different that way i find some people they really are s scale aficionados and right and other people i see other people that play completely by ear yep yeah yep and and some great musicians yes. that, that have great. never taken yeah. a lesson in the day of their life it, exactly yeah so um as i mentioned in the intro you then started some bands and and when you're young yes. which is really cool because yeah. that, that takes guts too right yeah you know uh i was i like to say i was slow and skinny so mm -hmm. <laughs> i wasn't going to meet people through sports teams got it <laughs> and uh thank but, god for the arts yeah <laughs> But my brother, uh, we're only 14 months apart, he got into drums, and he, great drummer, and he took it, he was just the opposite. He had lessons, he took lessons for a number of years, he could read music, he, um, he was a much better, at, in terms of training, uh, a musician. But we, uh, so we started our first, we played up in the attic in our home, my mm -hmm. mom moved back to Houston, uh, that, okay. that marriage only lasted a couple years, and she was super supportive, and uh, we, we that was our first hand at writing our own songs. And I thank the Lord to this day that none of that was recorded. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll never forget, we finally had some friends come over and, and one of them suggested we do a cover song. Cause we, at that time we just did our own wow. original song. Opposite of what we usually <laughs> and have. And I can't That's remember cool. what song it was. It was probably, it might've been even a Led Zeppelin, which my mom hated, but <laughs> I remember we came down from the attic and she said, well, what was that song you were playing for the first time? <laughs> right, <laughs> nice. So, nice. So, um, so, so we, we started a band, and um, uh, I remember our first gig, my mom, uh, she had a, I think it was a Lincoln Mark V. It was like a boat. It right. was the, we could get everything <laughs> in that trunk, all the gear that we had in the trunk with, you know, space for two stowaways. I mean, you could, you could totally get in. And all the drums. So she could drive right. us to... 
I think we maybe had two gigs in the course of a year. <laughs> so, but, uh, so that was great. So yeah, we had, um, interesting story The um, uh, my, my buddy, Jeff was probably my best friend in high school at the time. Uh, we didn't go to local public school, so I, I didn't know a lot of the kids in the neighborhood. So we kind of stuck together and he got a beautiful, I think with this paper route money, a, a black Fender Stratocaster mm. and he got really into it and he, he, he was pretty gifted um, got to become a lead guitar player. But then, <clears throat> at that time, uh, late 70s, early 80s, um, we were buried down on disco, and he just went 180 and got into punk. Okay. And I couldn't go there. You, okay. And he also started dr- getting into uh, drinking and smoking pot. And uh, he, he, lo and behold, one night at like 4 in the morning, got our PA system, which I owned half of, <laughs> loaded up his family's a suburban and ran away to LA. Wow. And we were a sophomore year of high school. Wow. <laughs> so Talk about so that ended that band. <laughs> that ended that. We didn't even have he, our, our guitar player was gone or lead guitar player and we didn't have our sound system so. <laughs> right. That kind of ended that. That kind of ended that. Right. Yeah. Well, you said that you took a hiatus you you when you went to college and so um, takes a little bit to that, what, what you went to college for, and then how you started playing again. Yeah, so I went to the University of Vermont, and I always had a guitar with me. Got it. Um, and it was, it, it was a, just a great stress relief. Um, but at that time, yeah, it, it, too many things going on to, to start a band. I knew some guys that had some bands, and um, uh, but would come home. Uh, and at that point, we'd moved to Vermont. And would, we had a cover band, and I, I think the first two summers of college we played a couple gigs, um, but then it just really started to phase out. Um, so I always had the guitar with me, and went on to grad school in Colorado, where I met my wife. Um, in grad school, we would have these sing-alongs, and my buddy Jim made these fake books. Uh, he made multiple copies, I'm sure, uh, not legally, <laughs> and uh, we would just uh, at, at that time get together and kind of have the book out and uh sometimes our whole graduate class it was a small program we'd get together um, nice. we were in a higher ed administration uh, program so kind of people that maybe wanted to be like a dean of students at a college or run a career center or something like that um and uh one gentleman this guy that made these fake books jim was a, a really good guitar player and he taught me a few a few chords and uh, different ways of playing some chords so you learn you pick up something along the way from right. all these people right. you'd meet <clears throat> And uh, he went on after our program. To, you know, t- he tried his hand at doing it professionally. Released a couple CDs, and um, uh, but but that was just a laid back time where music did take a bit of a backseat. Um, uh, but then it picked up when I came back here. So your hiatus was more from playing playing gigs. Yes, you playing still gigs. Played I guitar. still played. Got it. I okay, always good. had it there. But being yeah. in a band, right, and putting gigs, effort into that right. side of it. Yeah, yes, got yeah. it. Okay. And yeah. then when you came to Minnesota, you decided to, that you had maybe some more time on your hands. I, I had a maybe. little more time on my hands. So yeah. um, you might rem- remember there was a music store called Centerfield Music. On Bridge Square. Um, I think that was before my time here, but yes. That gentleman, Ted Vig, ran that store. Oh, I've heard about him. Yeah. I still had all my, I had my Strat copy. I had my Fender Deluxe Reverb Amp. I had a couple effects, but life was slowing down. I wanted to get an acoustic guitar, and so I I traded it all (laughs) in to get this acoustic guitar. Still needed to pony up some cash to get it. And to this day, when I look at what those things are selling for, I'm like, why did I do that? But I definitely wanted to get into the acoustic scene, so uh, so I'd gotten rid of all that stuff. Um, but um, actually, started playing in church and at Bethel. And um, I, what I haven't told you is, like uh, in my younger years, I had terrible stage fright. Okay, and interesting. Like would literally get nauseous, sometimes throw up. You know, wow. before a show. I remember one of those gigs in Houston. My mom making me a banana milkshake to try to <laughs> get something down. <laughs> Oh, how did you? Uh, okay, so why? Why did you keep get, getting back on the stage with that kind of fright? That's you know, amazing. It's, it's funny, and uh, at one level, I was afraid of, <clears throat> you know, screwing up the performance. But really, it became a vicious cycle. I was worried about getting too nervous. Ah, yeah. And but I loved it so much because once you're up there, and I'm an extrovert, it goes away. You know, it just yeah, it does. It's like as soon as you get up there, as soon as you start, it goes away. Yeah. <clears throat> but even through college or grad school, I still had that same kind of performance anxiety. And it, it, it was church. 
uh, there's two things. You, well, you figure you're playing in church, it's got to be a forgiving crowd. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's like the gospel, right? Right, 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 um, right. So I figured if I made a mistake, nobody was going to judge me too hard. Yeah. Um, and the other one was having children. I have I'm a proud father of four kids, and it just took the focus off of me. Ah, once oh, I started, yeah. once I stopped, and, and, and anxiety works different for everybody. I'm right. not saying that this is how, it just happened that for me, uh, my anxiety, I think, was driven by a lot of self-focus. Got and it. once I stopped dwelling on myself, I just got, and, and I, getting to play in church kind of really helped in the repetition of it. Yeah. And Joel Cooper was always seemed to always be at my side. Joel is a former IT director at Carleton, but um, tremendous bass player. Wendy and I have had the chance to play with Joel a lot and, yes. uh, and been in a di- couple of different bands. And um, so that's how, yeah, I got back into it in Minnesota. You know that's such great insight that what you said about stopping, you know, fo- stopping to focus. Sorry, I can't. How do I say that? That you stopped focusing on yourself so much, yeah. and that that takes some of your anxiety away. Of, although being a parent can add a lot of anxiety. It's like too, a, different but it's a different type of anxiety, yeah. isn't it? It's yeah. a, for me, it's like it felt more manageable because it wasn't all my crap. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thanks for taking us through that journey. We're not up to current, and we'll talk about uh, your gig coming up, and we'll talk about Fred the Bear then. But uh, let's let's move on to this first song that you chose for, to play today, which is called Girl with the Artificial Heart. And this is a Rob Morrow uh, tune that you played when you were in um, in Scaredy Cat Blackie with yeah, him, right? Right. And so why don't you tell us a little bit about this song, maybe about the studio experience. Was it your first time in the studio? When you recorded that, with it them. was yeah. Okay. So um, it was very much a studio project. Uh, Rob and Joel Cooper and I had, had been in a group along with Joel Bython, a local drummer. Um, uh, Joel's and um, Matt Arthur and Brett Landers. Got um, it. W- we'd we'd played with Rob a few times, mostly at the Cave at Carlton. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, but Rob, he, he just a gifted. Uh, particularly lyricist, but mm-hmm. also songwriter, and he just really all of a sudden got into. He turned his attention to to, to writing music, and we were doing some of his more and more of his original work. Um, talented family. Rob's brother Barry wrote the screenplay to Rain Man, this wow. Academy Award winner. Wow. Um, so I think some of that rubbed off. And sure. as Rob will call it, uh, it, it was his vanity project to get mm-hmm. in the studio. But we had the good fortune to be at Salma Gundy with Steve yes, McKinstry. Yes, brilliant. Yeah, an incredible engineer, the most incredible equipment you've ever seen in terms of amps and mics. And, and some vintage stuff to oh, get just interesting vintage. songs that oh, you, or yeah. sounds that you might not get anywhere else, right? Yeah. yeah. So I remember we went to the cow and Rob sat us down in, in the booth and we said, hey, I'm going to make this album. You guys want to be a part of it? I said, yeah, yeah. What? I, not knowing at all what this was going to be like. <laughs> so I had these images of like we'd all be in one room together you know mm-hmm. and maybe we'd have some baffling between us or right. something but you know you play and it was very different than that um which, which, not bad or good um but we kind of all did our original takes i remember <laughs> i thought you know we were in the studio booth and you have the window and then you can you see the performing booth where the mics and i thought well, well i'll be in there you know instead he went all oh, this trouble putting this amp like on this shrine, There's a, this amazing tweed amp, probably from the 40s, 50s, I'm, I should say. And he got it all mic'd up. And then he, I just brought my guitar. I just sat next to him in the booth nice. playing these tracks with a click track and going on. And, and so it was a really different process sure. than, what I, than what, you thought. what I thought it would be. Yeah. Right. And uh, I'd, I'd worked out some things, but a lot we had to work out on the fly. Wow. Yeah, so a lot of the parts in this song, uh, I had the main, uh, <clears throat> there's a little intro uh, riff there that I had I had created um, when we played it live, but most all these other riffs we just did. In Pro Tools, this is incredible, magical <laughs> yes, <exactly>. software. <laughs> well, there's there so many use. layers to this song. Like you said, a lot of riffs that just, just weave its, their way throughout the right. song, which is very, very cool. Yeah. So you're playing rhythm? I'm playing lead guitar lead? Okay. on it was, it was Rob's uh, Telecaster and uh, <laughs> a lot of this song is about fake girls very good looking <laughs> got it <laughs> I think Rob may be pined, saying it all very good Rob may have pined after fake. at one point yeah right <laughs> just <saying. laughs> so well, it's a tone uh, angst before tone is the name of the album so awesome if that and, tells you anything okay yes exactly <laughs> all the 
Yeah, that that is a great title. I love that title, yeah. and I love this song. It's beautifully, beautifully engineered. It and is played. so great. I mean, that's wow, the thing about that album. On. It just it took a while to, to to finally finish, and I was only a, a small part of it. But uh, the end product is just it's really incredible. Pr- really that there's wonderful. You know, there's the spectrum of sound, and and a lot of times on albums you have things fighting in that that are are living in that same in one little a- area of that spectrum. And what I love about this is just he Steve, and he's just he's just a genius. Uh, Steve McKinstry, he he has things everywhere on that spectrum, oh, and things amazing. aren't fighting, and, and it's all sitting right there. So. Um, yeah, Steve's playing the Hammond B3 on this. And, yeah, oh, and that's beautiful. It's just, it's just, yep. So now that we set you up to listen to this <laughs> song, let's take a listen to Girl with the Artificial Heart, a tune by Rob Morrow, on which my guest, Bo Aylin, plays lead guitar. Over the rainbow and the darkness of trees, safe from the dangers of social disease. Natural disaster that's way off the charts She's the girl with the artificial heart Drives too fast, the traffic is slow Got to keep moving, she got no place to go 63 Chevy with replacement parts She's the girl with the artificial heart Tries to be real Tries too hard Buys her own groceries Mows her own yard not looking for a man who lives in a shopping car She's the girl with the artificial heart All summer Out at the lake Feels right at home Where everyone's fake A couple of drinks And it's time to act smart She's the girl With the artificial heart Tattoo of a shamrock one of a horse Tastefully hidden From view of course Looks pretty normal What sets her apart She's the girl With the artificial heart Sacrificial What does she care Her love is superficial The lips are sweet But the aftertaste is tart She's the girl With the artificial heart Does the end Justify the means She's the meanest thing I ever seen Someone tell Lucifer she's doing her part She's the girl with the artificial heart It's 
Pauline Jennings, and you're listening to Musician Talk. We just heard my guest today, Bo Allen, play guitar on Girl with the Artificial Heart, which he recorded with the group Scaredy Cat Blackie. Well, again, what a beautifully uh, engineered song and beautifully written, too, the, the lyrics. And I love how Steve has the voice mixed so present mm-hmm. so you can understand all the lyrics. So often I'm listening to a song and go, come on, I want to hear what they're saying. Why yeah. write lyrics if you can't understand them? Right. So I love that about Steve. He just makes sure that you can hear those lyrics when he mixes things. It seems it's the stuff that I've heard that he's done. Um, it's really a supremely cool chill song isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's it is. like <laughs> great vibe <laughs> right yeah. right right and it's very tasty very tasty uh guitar work thank you nicely done yeah. nicely played so um i want to jump into this we talked a little bit about uh when we were visiting before we started the show about this and um when we were communicating back and forth by email and i asked you to be on the show you said yes but um i have to, maybe have to get over a little bit my imposter complex i have when it comes to being a musician and i I really thought that's interesting and a good thing to talk about because what does make a musician? What, how, does, how, does, uh, how does our society define a musician? How does, how do you, how does a person internally define that? And what, what elicited that comment from you? I mean, you've been playing your whole life. Uh, right, yeah. Um, you know, I, I think some of it, back when I was a kid, I never, like, I mentioned this to you, I, I never had long hair. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I love that. And I just, I, I remember at various points in my life, well, to really be a musician, you've got to do this or you've got to look like that. And I never really looked like that. And um, I never, I never considered it as a vocation. Got it. You know, for me, it was always, you know, although I dreamed, I remember just turning on albums and playing guitar and always dreamed of being a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> but, but when it came down to it, you know, I, uh, I just didn't feel like I was going to be cut out for it. So the, so I think that, that, you know, I know so many people that have tried their hand at it at least, or, you know, kind of wanted to see it if, if not their vocation, certainly a, like a second job right. career. And for me, it was just, you know, something I just love to do. And, um, but I, I have come around, uh, you know, that I've been <laughs> I'm 55, <laughs> I've been playing since I was 13, so maybe I should give myself a little... <laughs> you, I think you should, I'm giving you permission <laughs> yeah. to call yourself, not that you need it for me, a musician. <laughs> yeah, you are a musician. Yeah. But it's interesting because, you know, do you have to be professional to, to give yourself that moniker? I, uh, I don't think so. Of course not. No. I mean, you can, like I was talking about my son, he doesn't play, he's never played in a band and probably never will, but he plays every day and mm-hmm. just for himself. And he's a musician. He is a musician. You know, yeah. How good do you have to be to call yourself a musician? Is your, when your, was your third grader who's just starting to play piano and has taken three lessons is that person, you know, is that child right. a musician? I don't know. I I Any think um, it was it was like when I took guitar lessons. I I wasn't really great at practicing the material that I was asked to practice, but nobody ever had told me to you know pick up that guitar. Right. And I think when you have a little bit of that self motivation and it's just something you're drawn to and that you want to do, I'm going to say for <laughs> you're a musician. <laughs> you're a musician. You're a musician. Exactly. Yeah. Whether you're playing in front of one people, a hundred people, or just on your own in your room. I have a little bit of that complex myself because I'm a singer. Right. And so it's like the musicians and the singer, you know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And so although you might say, or Steve might say, it's the musicians and the drummer. <laughs> That's a joke. But, um, you know, I, it, I, I don't necessarily consider myself a musician because mm. I don't play an instrument. But my instrument is my voice, so it's of course voice. I am, right? Right. But still, there's that, like, I don't even know why we even worry about the def- those definitions, but we do, don't we? We do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and okay, so now we're going to move on to this quote, and uh, and what I picked out was a Harry Man- a Henry Mancini quote, and uh, you are a financial planner, mm-hmm. and so I thought this kind of went well here. It says um, he said, "If you want to make money in music, get into the band uniform business." <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's so funny, and I wasn't going to use it because it's it's like a throwaway quote. But then when I started thinking about it, um, I got a little deeper. Which why do we do this? You know, it it's there are very very few people that make money uh, enough money to make a living, and also by the way, almost all of them. Well, I would say all of them self employed as musicians, and so they have to have insurance too. I mean, it's right. a lo- you got to make a lot of money to be able to 
raise a family and have insurance, all those kind of things. Why do we do it? Right. Why? You know, Why do you do it? And, and sometimes we, we joke, like, if you, if you figure out your hourly wage, you know, <laughs> right. your rehearsal time and the back and forth and getting the gigs and, uh, well, usually the advice is just don't do that because right. it's woefully, woefully small. Right. Um, you know, and, and, and one level, it feels like a bit of a luxury that I can say I don't do it for the money. Uh, because yeah. I've, I've I've played with people that need the money. Sure, you know, right? Um, that that we'd play a gig and like, hey, you know, I'd be kind of cavalier about whether we get paid at the gig or after. And like, I need to get paid. Like, I need, no. you know, right? And so, so I totally respect the people that that do that. But it is so hard. It and, is so hard. And it it absolutely if you can't you can't define it. I just what I love about it is that it's it, it's a way to bring people together, community yep. together. And some of the most rewarding things for me of when we've been able to use the music as a way to benefit greater causes and, and getting yeah. to play part of benefit concerts throughout the Bears, done a number of them. And I, even back to my, my cover band in high school, I mean, we did a couple of benefits. And those nice. are just, so when that all comes together, you know, I think that's what really makes it. But you're absolutely right. I just, to me, why I never really gave it a lot of thought, just on a, at a business level, having some security. <laughs> right. It just seems like a non-starter, you know, yeah. unless you're just, you got to not only be wicked talented, but, but super driven, you know. And it's interesting because when, I mean, there's the bands that have to make money because that's how they're paying their bills and people and certain people in bands. But it is such a luxury to be able to uh, have a living and have mm-hmm. the income, so that y- you have so much more freedom then of of the of the gigs that you choose, yes, and where you play. And really, seriously, um, venues pay the same as they paid thirty years ago. Yeah. I mean, it's there's nothing, there's no growth there, right? And and yet everything else is so much more expensive. So I'm, I'm, this is just a plug to all venue owners. Come on, pay us more, <laughs> uh, but. Uh, that it, it is different. It is difficult, and I think also that the even the people that don't play out, and mm-hmm. so it's not about community. Mm-hmm. Um, they get something in the brain happening there yes, with, no with playing. No yeah. doubt. Yeah, it's uh, the the relaxation of it, or the the the, the whatever is released in your brain, the chemicals that that come with playing. I think are, is so important as well, and keeps us playing and keeps us singing. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Um, we have another song that is not recorded. Right. In fact, uh, you're going to play it live, and I'm very excited about it. Uh, this is called <clears throat> Just This. And before you play, we you wrote this song. It's an original. Yep. And you don't write a lot of tunes, I think you told me. No. And so uh, do you push yourself to write then if it doesn't really kind of flow out of you? Do you push yourself because you want to write? Or when you do decide to do it and these aren't there's more than two choices here of course um, <laughs> <laughs> or, or it does it when you do sit down and do it then it kind of flows once you start it uh i, d- I or, definitely don't push myself <laughs> okay <laughs> which got it probably <laughs> explains why there it, there's not been a lot of productivity um they're, they're just i kind of wait for these moments it's always 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 in the morning it's always like right before i get up Wow. And that occasionally, and it happens maybe twice a year. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> it. Um, sometimes more that that just something will flow, and that's usually some type of melody. Okay. Um, more frequently than that, I'm jotting things down, just maybe song ideas. I have such a hard time co- telling a whole story. I always have all these fragments. Got it. Um, but but this is one where it finally just came out, and uh, I, I was taking yoga. Um, at Heartwork Yoga here in okay. our field. And it took me a long time, but I'd, I'd never even tried meditation. Um, but there's an element of meditation in yoga. I don't yep. know if you've done yoga. Um, and I was finally kind of getting the space where, you know, I could be in this class and I wasn't self-conscious, right? I was just like kind of in focus, as you say, on your breathing. And I, I can't remember who the instructor, it might have been Shawnee or Amy, um, but just this idea of let's just be here. Mm. Just this. Yes. Just this. And it, it just made me think about how infrequently <laughs> just in the moment, you know. And so that was whatever I was paying for that class. <laughs> I got a lot out of it because that, that idea of being about being present. And oh, it's, it's so that, huge. So that inspired the song, and but I really... What I tie it back to is just the concept of time, um, because it's a devil um, of a thing, you know. Mm-hmm. And that, it, you know, it 
uh, it just goes by faster and faster as you get on. older. Yeah. Yeah. My, my theory um, about that is it's math, is that when you're, one, when you're two, a year is half your life. Yes. Right? When you're 90, it's a 90th. Yep. So, of course, it goes faster. And ni- you know, 90 times faster. It does. Right. right. <laughs> and, I, and I make a reference to that in the song, this, this concept of like, despite, um, you know, what our perception of time is and the fact that, you know, we'll eventually run out of it. Right. Um, we've got to try to just focus on right Being here, present. Right now. And um, I'm trying to get better at that. So this song was an attempt at that. So. All right. Well, <clears throat> let me introduce it. All right. And now, ladies and gentlemen, live from the KYMN studio in beautiful downtown Northfield is Bo Allen playing his original tune called Just This. <laughs> You can climb the mountain You can sail the sea Plant your garden Pick your peas It keeps on going And we give chase Steal the hair right off your head Put lines on your face It's sneaking behind your back Right under your nose In the blink of an eye Another door will close Remember when you were a kid Living for the moment Let's climb out of our heads And consider Just this Like a stint in detox the minutes shuffle by A day can last forever For the unoccupied Looking back at pictures The old black and whites I like the way it softens your eyes When you smile at the light It's sneaking behind your back Right on the old nose In the blink of an eye Another door will close I know these hands can heal But they keep ticking away Let's ease up on the gas And see Just this You're going to bridge This old guitar sounds sweeter with age Don't need validation, it just wants to be played What's your perspective on this snapshots in time? A string of ups and downs of something divine It's sneaking behind your back, right under your nose In the blink of an eye, another door will close I know these hands can heal, but they keep ticking away Let's ease up on the gas and see Just this This is Musician Talk, and I'm your host, Pauline Jennings. My guest today is Bo Allen. You just heard him play live for us his, his original song called Just This. All right. Nice. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> that is wonderful. There's so many lines in there. I was writing, uh, writing down so I remember them. That climb out of your heads and, and consider just this and ease up on the gas and see just this. this. I love that. And I, I could talk about being in the present moment. We could talk about that for a lot, a long time, because mm-hmm. it's so important to me. Um, when you're an actress, 
the way you're the best on stage is if you're completely in the moment. So that's why, like, if if a person's on stage thinking about their hands, well, you're not in the present moment. Right. You're thinking about your hands. You're not thinking. About, it's so important, and I think as an artist, it's it's doubly important. But as a human being, it's so important because, you, like you said, the time just goes, and yes. I could just talk about this forever because <laughs> it's so important to me. But I'll turn it back to you. Wonderful job. Thank Wonderful you so performance. much. Performance. Thank you. Uh, no fret noise. I like that very clean <laughs> guitar playing. That's a beautiful sounding guitar. Thank you. I love the guitar. Yeah. yeah, and I, uh, the lyric that the, the guitar gets sweeter with age, it, it definitely has been the case. It's nice. Just, so, so time does make us age, but that can be a beautiful thing. Right, it can be sweet. It can be <laughs> yeah. very sweet. And your voice, I really like your the, your inflections, and it's you're spot on with your intonation. So. Well, thank well you. Job. Well I usually, job. if I'm compared to anybody, it's usually Bob Dylan. <laughs> well, you know what? It's not because you. It's not because you're kind of off the note like Bob Dylan is, but it's you bend notes a little bit. The yeah, so I did I hear that to too. Yeah. You, you, at the end of notes, and you bend like he yeah. does. And I, if I can't voice. get to a certain note, I just hit the, a little falsetto. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, a Dwight yeah. Yoakam esque thing. That's but, smart. Yeah. That's work. Somebody it, told me years ago that. Um, the difference, it, like Mick Jagger and Robert Plant. I mean, Robert Plant can really sing. I mean, yeah. Mick Jagger can't really sing, but he sounds good. Right. You know? right. <laughs> it's like, right. If, if I could just sound good, you yeah. know, if I could be in tune, you know, and, and, you and are. just sound, that's, that's, that's all that I'm trying to achieve. <laughs> and I think popping up to that falsetto as in, it, it makes it more interesting. Yeah. You know, I, I, yeah. It's, 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 it's why I, love, I mean, I'm not a huge country guy, but I love Dwight Yoakam's voice for that reason. He just, mm-hmm. he, the way he has those breaks, yeah. it yeah. just, it adds a certain color. It does. That makes it interesting. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. We're getting to the end here, and I'm wondering if you have picked out best gig, worst gig for me. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> you know, start starting with the worst gig. Mm. Anytime. Anyway. And I have to do a compendium. I, I apologize. You probably hate this from your guests <laughs> because I couldn't think of, of just one, although the list is much longer for the best. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah, and that's usually how it is. It's, yeah. Thank gosh. Yeah, one, this. one thing, it wasn't the gig itself because I remember the gig going well, but we had this cover band. We were called AA Bottom. Okay. And uh, we actually, this is in Vermont, and our debut was at a, a high school talent show. And we we got a few bands I think we had like four or five songs but we could not come up with a name and finally we, we were literally at the show because they just had our <laughs> names in there and I said we got to name you something and for some reason opposites were in we would just call we had a friend named John Brown we called called him Bill White you know just you know that kind of thing <laughs> <Right>. <clears throat> and we, one of the opposites was you guys are from Houston it's easy top a, a bottom got <laughs> so, it alright and you know All so right. we'll change it later right, right. <laughs> <You know>, we'll, <laughs> <laughs> we never did so like you know I was in that band for probably four years a, a bottom but we played a this little town of Halifax Vermont I, I want to say population 56 got it <laughs> and they had a graduation party and back then it wasn't like now like, like this whole concept of you graduate from high school in Minnesota, you feed the town. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, every there it was just, you know, the whole class got together in one place and, you know, and they usually had a party or something like that. So we, we, we played this gig and I remember we got crazy, we put dippity doo in our hair to give <laughs> ourselves a little punk rock look. And and the gig was fine, the kids seemed kinda of into it, but like I'm I there's this guy in the audience, kind of a tough farm looking kid. And just everybody else seemed to be enjoying it and just given snarls, you know, particularly my direction. <laughs> and so we took a break, and our, our singer comes over to me. He's kind of pacing, placing himself in between this guy and me Uh-oh. and basically saying, uh, this kid, don't want to scare you, but this kid over here wants to beat you up. <laughs> oh, no. Like, what did I say? Did it's I like, do? I don't even talk during these things. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if his girlfriend maybe it took a shine. I don't know what it was, right, but right. and it was just getting worse. Like the and, and, and the guys is getting closer oh, as no. we're playing, and I'm like, <laughs> so uh, I remember uh, it was one of the few times I didn't have to take out any of the gear because as soon as we were done, literally the rest of the guys in the band just kind of escorted me wow. to the car. I had my guitar in my case, and I remember being driven off because. And he had another buddy with him that it was starting to swirl. <laughs> so that was the worst ending of any kid because yeah, I thought no I was going to get my butt kicked. <laughs> well, and hard to con- a little bit hard to be present. It was when, very hard to be present. <laughs> when yeah. That's going on. <laughs> the second part of that gig was not not so fun. So, so, so the other one was uh, not long ago in the height of COVID. I think it was summer of 2020. 
Fred the Bear was in at the Eagles Club in Rochester, set to play outside. We were nervous about the weather. It was starting to be impending. And this entire, you know, we're all masked. Everybody's masked. We're, right. Of course, we're outside. Right. This entire, I wouldn't call them a biker gang, but it certainly looked like every, all these people come in on Harleys. And yeah, I'm sure they're lovely people, but there was uh, outdoor seating, these picnic tables. And I just remember they went to the far, it's like as far away as they could get from the stage. <laughs> All of their backs to us. Wow. None of them asked. <laughs> Smoking oh. and drinking. And, <laughs> right. and we played three songs and boom, lightning came. We had, we had our gear got wet. We had, oh, to, you no. know, so there's those gigs too, right? There are those gigs. And, yes. and uh, in the Prairie Creek group with uh, Alyssa Leonard and Peter Dickens, we had a gig like that, you know, where you, <laughs> you pray you don't get electrocuted and right. then you hope right. your amps don't get <laughs> destroyed. Right. So. That you don't ruin all your <laughs> right. expenses. Here. Yeah, so fortunately, most of them were like that. Nothing, no uh, projectiles were ever thrown or anything like that. That's so, good. Fortunately, so. Good, good, good. The best gig, um, oh, you know, one of the best uh, more recently was uh, we call it Thanksgiving. But <laughs> Thanksgiving <laughs> Eve. <laughs> <Nice>. Thanksgiving <laughs> Eve. Got it. I don't know what it is, but uh, at Eminent, which just, if you've ever played there, it feels like you're in your own living room. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, that night, this last Thanksgiving, we had. Just a lot of friends with people that we knew, and it just was, tra- we just got in the pocket and just transcended, yeah. and all of a sudden you're playing things, and you're like, I, I'm not, I can't, I, I'm not even thinking about it. It's yeah. just flowing, and yes. and it, it, that was just one of those times, and then I'd say the other times is when I've gotten to play with my kids. Ah, um, yes. So my daughter Barrett and I got to play at, um, our church has Bethel Stock. <laughs> and uh, oh, that's great. Thanks too. to all the fine people there for putting that on. Tom Leonard, at, Tom Leonard, I think donated all the staging and equipment. Um, and nice. uh, but Barrett has really developed a wonderful voice. She's a three-time rock and roll uh, revival performer. Nice. And I remember just getting to listen to her sing "Angel from Montgomery," mm. and which Alyssa Leonard, rest in peace, also would do. And that was just great. Yeah, yeah just just getting to I play bet. with your kids, see your progeny. Absolutely. Blossoming. There's just nothing like there that. There is nothing like that. Yeah, there's nothing like that. I agree. Well, that's beautiful, and it's a great spot to end. Except for before we do, I just want to mention again that you're playing May 20th. That's Friday? Friday. Friday, yep. May 20th um, at Armory Square outside, if weather permits. Will you be inside if it's raining? I think that is the backup plan, okay, usually. <laughs> well, sometimes there's no... That or we place, just cancel. Right, right <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so, so hopefully we'll have the same streak here. Make sure you get out to see that. And is there, uh, let's say I can't, I can't go to that gig because I'll be out of town. Uh, where can people go to see where you're playing? Uh, Fred the Bear? So there's fredthebear.com, our oh, website. Easy. And I know we're going to be doing Dairy Days in Byron, Minnesota this year. <laughs> Uh, w- the other gig that uh, was I had I had to I have to say this at least because it, this is probably going to happen. It happened to me once, and it's probably never going to happen again. But on my birthday last summer, we got to open up for Thirty Eight Special in Rochester, oh. and we performed in front of fifteen thousand people. Okay, you <laughs> so, had to. Say so I had to one. say that one. You had to. My my. my my buddy Ray could Ray would be very disappointed if I didn't. And um, now I like to say that probably fourteen thousand five hundred of them were not paying attention to us, but still being on a stage in front of that many people oh, no was kidding. absolutely incredible. I bet. And so, uh, so just thoroughly enjoyed that. Although some of that stage fright came back for that, yeah, yeah, <laughs> for yeah, that gig yeah. when you're in front of that many oh, yeah, people, yeah. it's a little nerve wracking. But 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 that was great. But yeah, we're 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 going to have a busy summer, and we're having. Uh, we're leaving the county to go up to a, a show in Grand Rapids, and the next night in Halleck, Minnesota. Fine. If you don't know where that is, that's a about tour. as far northeast tour. you can go in the state of Minnesota <laughs> with, with with any civilization. So, looking forward to that. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun, and you'll be playing around here, I'm At, sure, plenty. Absolutely, yeah. So we'll have some more gigs at Imminent and other places. Yep. So. And to find those gigs, just go to fredthebear.com. Yep. Thank you so much, Bo, for being on the show today. Thank you, Paul. This is a lot of fun. Great conversation. A true and pleasure. We did fill in some details about <laughs> your musical journey, so thank you. Thank you. All right. Many thanks to Bo for joining me today to share his musical journey and to entertain us with a live song. As always, also, thanks to you for listening to Musician Talk on the One, KYMN. You have a terrific day.